Hi, welcome to the virtual edition of our year-round member screening series, Film Independent Presents. My name is Jen Wilson. I'm a senior programmer at Film Independent. I want to say a big thanks to Film Independent Presents lead sponsor, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, and thanks to our new official partner, Vision Media. We're now taking Film Independent Presents digitally, digitally on this exciting virtual screening platform. Also, Film Independent now has a COVID-19 Emergency Filmmaker Support Fund for Film Independent Fellows. If you'd like to find out more about that, you can go to our website at filmindependent.org and look under Education and Resources, or you can send an email to artistdevelopment at filmindependent.org. Just a note to everybody watching today, there is a question button at the bottom of the screen, so if you'd like to ask any of our panelists today a question, you can type that in there and we'll take the last 15 minutes of the Q&A to ask some audience questions. Uh, and now please welcome today's special guest from the film Sella and the Spades, um, which I should mention was also a project in our 2018 producing lab by a producer, Lauren McBride, uh, and was in the 2019 Sundance Film Festival. Please welcome writer, director, Thierry Chapeau, and in the role of Sela, uh, Sela Levy Simone, and in the role of Paloma Celeste O'Connor. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um. So let's just dive right into Sela. Um. Um. Tanya, Risha, I had read that um, you originally conceived of this project as more of a sort of a non-linear. Um, multimedia. Um, what yeah. was it that made you decide to take it in a more linear direction and, and do you think your original concept of the movie still influenced what you ended up with? Totally. Um, yeah, that would it'd be impossible for it not to. It would be like my younger self not influencing my adult self in a way. I feel like the overture, which is the multimedia project, is very much in the DNA of the feature film script. Um, but I always knew I wanted to make a feature. So it was always my end goal to make Sell in the States a feature film. It was just that I didn't know how to write a feature. And so I started out by writing what I did know how to write, which was short stories and short films. Um, and then by the time I got to the end of just writing a bunch of short stories about this girl and her life and her world, it seemed sort of like a waste to not do something with all of that. Um, and since I wasn't ready to make a feature, I didn't have any money. I didn't have any, I didn't have any connections. I didn't really have any access to what I needed to make a feature. I just thought I will take what little money and resources I do have and do what I can do. And I'll make this multimedia project. And I'm glad I did because from that, we got so much attention that, I mean, it really, it, there's a direct line from making that project with the, the change that I had to, you know, where we are now. So I'm glad I did it. So what, um, talk about the, your inspiration for this story. What, uh, why did you want to tell the story of teenagers in a private boarding school? I was a teenager at a private boarding school. Okay. So <laughs> it, uh, and I, I don't really see that many present, or not necessarily a present day set, but that many more modern stories at boarding schools starring people who look like me and and if they were in a story about boarding school then it was almost always about how they were the only black kid at the school and the racism that they no doubt face um, again i went to boarding school but there was so much more to my experience in high school than just being the only one in the room or being a black girl a black kid at this like very privileged very white institution they were so like I had so much fun and I had so many adventures and I had I changed so much and I grew and I learned so much that I wanted to I just wanted to represent that in media I wanted to see myself in films and so when you were in in boarding school was it this sort of similar where there were like these factions no uh, not groups of people <laughs> no I mean that's just very heavily influenced by my love of mob films and specifically okay. my father I grew up watching the Godfather trilogy over and over and over again. And then when I was in high school, I saw this film called Brick by Ryan Johnson. I think yeah. it came out in 2007. Yeah. So I saw that. <laughs> in fact, it may, maybe it was 2005. 
because I wanted to check it out from the library, but I wasn't 18 yet. So I had to bribe a senior to check it out from the library. <laughs> to watch it. So okay. those sorts of things, you know, they've influenced my life a lot. I think Ryan Johnson would love that story to find out that you had to break the law to get his phone. Oh, we did that, yes. <laughs> um, uh, it's interesting because there's there's two times in the movie where you see a sign that says something about uh, gangs are prohibited, mm -hmm. um, and that that term's so loaded, gang, because usually in schools it's called like a social group or a fraternity or a sorority. Um, why is it that you, yeah, that that you use the word gangs in the uh, because, I mean, you can sort of see this in the film. Most of the kids who are a part of the factions are brown. And so my thinking was this school, again, a privileged, mostly white institution, if they see a bunch of brown kids congregating and breaking the law, they're going to call it a gang, no matter what they tell you to call it instead. So it was in part just thinking about what language the administration would use or has used. Like, I remember when I was in high school, a bunch of us, not a bunch of a, a bunch of the black kids we didn't get in trouble but we were discouraged against all sitting at the same table in the cafeteria and it was like a very weird random thing where we didn't really understand where it was coming from because from our perspective we were just hanging out and so right. i think that from the perspective of these factions or the kids in the factions for, I mean, ultimately, they're really just hanging out with each other, but they're hanging out around this organized activity. And in the view of the school, that's a gang because you're brown. So yeah. I think that was a big part of it. That seems like a very common thing that happens in the world. Uh, when, <laughs> when, when I programmed for LA Film Festival, we showed a, a documentary on the Venice skate uh, mm -hmm. roller skate roller skate scene in um, the 1980s and that whole area was torn down and cleared out because it, it was determined that there were too many people of color gathering there and they needed to just tear it down and put it in a skateboard park. Yeah, and too many people of color gathering used to be illegal and yeah. now it's just encouraged that you don't do that. Yeah. You've come, you've come so far. So far. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of my favorite scenes in this is um, when you sort of, uh, uh, when Celeste's character first comes and she's trying to take a picture of the cheerleading squad and um, it breaks out into this sort of break, you're sort of leaving the present moment and Lovey as Sulla is, is giving a speech about how they're viewed as teenage girls. Um, and um, you know, told what to wear, told if they look pretty enough or not, by everybody, adults, boys. Uh, and this is a scene that I've watched over and over because it inspires me so much and so powerful. Do you want to talk about composing that? Me? Yeah, totally. Yeah, you, um, we're, we're, we're <laughs> loving and, yeah. and lovey too, yeah. and lovey too. But I mean, I do think that lovey, lovey, you... I mean, you make that scene work because <laughs> it's been the same since I, I, like that scene, I first wrote it for the overture. So it's a section of the overture is that speech or that monologue that she's giving. Um, but ultimately they're just words on a page, right? Words on a page written by an adult. Um, and so what Lovey, what you do really well, I think in that scene is just, <laughs> this is going to sound very basic, but you, allow her to be a teenage girl. Like you let her be saying these very powerful, very self-assured words the way that a teenage girl would say them. Not somebody who has all the answers or somebody who has hindsight, but somebody who's currently going through things. And I think that that's what makes it so, I mean, so effective. It's not just the words. <laughs> I think the words are fine, but it's the way that you, and, and you do like, you do this throughout the film, but I think particularly in this direct address to camera, you, remind us over and over that this is a story about teenage girls who are ultimately just kids trying to figure it out. Um, so I love that scene. Thanks, Arisha. <laughs> Do you remember 
uh, how many times you did it and if it was a difficult scene to do, Levy. I'm basically asking if Tyresha is perfectionist and drove you crazy. Really a perfectionist. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> She knows what she wants too Lovey's much. Lovey's like, no comment. <laughs> no, I, she knows what she wants. So it was always easy, like, once you got, like, her lingo, you know? So I don't remember how many times we took that scene, but it went kind of quick. We only did it, I think we only did it about four times. Um, and then we pieced it together. You guys don't have to leave yourself on mute. That was just for yeah. <laughs> Copy. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't want you to have to keep turning that off and on. <laughs> I keep forgetting. Um, yeah, I think we only did it like four, maybe five times. Um, and then we pieced it together. But in fact, maybe it was three times. And most of the take that we used was like the second take. I remember that. <laughs> that was my favorite take. Um, so sometimes, I mean, I think, but also I like to do that one a few times because we were only in, like we only were in that gym all day long. And so we only had a few small scenes to do there. And so I just wanted her to, or I wanted you, Lovey, to find your own rhythm. I feel like <laughs> it's so fascinating to hear you say, oh, you have to find Tyresha's rhythm, and then it goes really smooth. I even mean, feel like in that, like, you drove the rhythm of the day. So that was really, which was great for us, because <laughs> Spirit Squad needs to feel like, inner, like that energy. You can't really fake it. So that's why we did it. Yeah. <laughs> It's all about Sella. <laughs> um, you know, some, sometimes this movie, you mentioned um, Ryan's brick. Um, sometimes this movie does feel like a it has a little bit of an air of mystery to it. Because you're, you don't know who the rat is, or if there is one. You don't know exactly what's going on with that. Uh, if it's Maxi, right. if someone's trying to make it seem like it's maxi um was that something that you wanted was sort of a slow release of information like how we slowly get information about Celis, former number two yeah and it's not just it's the slow release of information that's important to the story but it's also the fact that you never really you never really know what the true true like the truest version of the truth is like everybody that anyone is getting information from as in real life everybody has an agenda so bobby telling paloma what happened to tila she's doing it for a reason and like it's not like a reason that's benefiting paloma necessarily um maxi and his deal with the ledger and losing that like like he anything that he says to paloma out of anger is for a reason like everybody has an agenda any information that they're revealing it's not just out of the kindness of their hearts. It's typically because like information is currency. So I did want to, um, I never wanted us to feel like we had, I guess as a writer, I never want us to feel like we have like, these are the facts because I don't really think that that's life, unfortunately. And I think that the idea of truth is really malleable. And so, I think particularly when you are in a very insular world where you can't escape the kids that you go to school with because you live with them, truth becomes, or the currency of truth is just a lot stronger. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I like to see how they, how they trade on their versions of the truth. Um, I think it's really effective. So you say you love mafia films and mob films. Did, did you want us to see um, Stella as sort of a godfather? Sella. There's a godmother in this situation. That's an interesting question. Um, no, I think Sella, we should really just think of her more as somebody who grew up watching The Godfather than, <laughs> than thinking of her as The Godfather or as Michael. Um, yeah, I think she's just somebody who, like the rest of us, grew up watching these stories of power and influence in organized crime. Um, but I would say that maybe Paloma's got a little bit Michael Corleone in her. If we, <laughs> we oh see God. Paloma in the next movie, I don't know. <laughs> she seems, she's got a lot of Michael. There's something there under the surface. Something. It's <laughs> brewing. Matt and Maxie's sunny. <laughs> or, or Fredo. Or Fredo. No. 
No. <laughs> Let's say Max. <laughs> I can't make them afraid of no. <laughs> um, so let's let's talk about your casting. You have an incredible cast. I'm not just saying that because your cast is here, but um, <laughs> did you did you have certain people in mind um, when when you were writing, and, or did you find everybody that you found during a casting process, or how did it? Um, work? Everyone was found through casting. We worked with Jessica Daniels, who's a phenomenal casting director based in New York. Uh, except Jarrell, who I knew from the summer before when I did the, uh, the directing lab at Sundance. They let you bring a couple of actors with you to be in your scenes that you're shooting that summer. And so I brought Jarrell, uh, Jarrell to be Maxi in those scenes. And it just was the perfect fit. So <laughs> we didn't change anything. And so he was the only one who was cast before for the casting session. Yeah, but everybody else was with Jessica Daniels and she's really good. She's really, really good. Because not only does she have very good instincts about who would fit well where, but she's also really good at, she's really good at helping you realize the correct decisions for your story yourself, as opposed to being like, this is my recommendation as a professional casting director. It's never that. It's always a collaboration. Like, how are we working together? How are we talking about these characters? How are we coming to these conclusions together? So I prefer that because I think collaboration is more fun, always. You know, it's very nice of you to give a shout out to your casting director. She's uh, brilliant. I yeah. love her. <laughs> That's not something that happens, and I don't think that that directors aren't grateful. I think they just forget that you know they got this help. So yeah, great. I think that's really nice um, of you. I've seen a lot of directors forget about help along the way. Um, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, for loving it, uh, what was it? Did you did you get a chance to read the whole script before saying yes to doing it? And and if so, what was the what was it that made you want to do this movie? <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> um, I didn't read the entire script all the way through because I have this thing where it's like auditions really just come and go, so I don't want to get too, too attached. So I kind of read the script like when things are kind of looking like they're in my favor. Um, <laughs> But I did read a lot of the script and I was like, oh my God, like I would really love to just like be in this world and I wonder what it looks like and smells like and all this other stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, it was a long time ago. I honestly don't remember. Um, but wow. it, yeah, I, <laughs> for me, I, since I'm a student, I was, I was taking organic chemistry. Um, when I got this part and or when I even got the audition for it um <laughs> and so that was kind of like the headspace that I was in at that time um and and I I love the character I love the character and then I also loved Tyresha when we met over Skype and I think that was also one of the factors that I was like, okay, I'm dropping organic chemistry. <laughs> I'm leaving that. And I'm going to go hang out with this super <laughs> cool director. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I love the story. I thought it was so, like, it was so interesting and compelling. And then meeting Tyree Show, I was like, okay, this is someone that I, like, really want to work with and, like, get to know and have the opportunity to, like, learn from this person. So that was... That was a big factor in it for me. Same, same with me, like with meeting Tyresha. And also now that I'm thinking back, um, when they sent the audition sides and the script, they also sent like the vision board for how it was going to look. And I was like, yes. holy crap, this yes. world, like I wanted to be, I wanted all parts of it. And like, it just looked like so well, like it just looked thoughtful and I love when things like have thought like put into them because then I'm like okay I can like work with my feelings here because that's all acting is like I could tell that story like you know so on top of meeting Tyresha too it was the vision board <laughs> yeah so the look at the look of the film is so specific and so it's just rich there's so much to see in it um 
do you want to talk? I think your your DP is actually a film independent uh, fellow as well. Yeah, he is. Do you want to talk about how you guys um, came to establish this look and, and why yeah. you wanted this look to tell this story? Yeah, so we'd been building our ideas around what the film would look like since 2015, I think we first met and started talking about it. So we had a couple of years, which first of all, time is all that I want ever. So having the time to build that was amazing. Um, and also just building a shorthand working relationship with each other was really beneficial. Um, but Jomo and I are just very similar people. Um, I'm sure these two have seen plenty of that. We just we're really good at like hyping each other up, which I feel like is an underrated part of your on-set collaborators, just having people who you can hype up and then also who are excited to hype you up. It feels really good. Um, but we talked a lot about, or I mean, it was also that along with starting to work with Jomo in 2015, you know, I'd been building looks and visuals and feels and color palettes for the world of this film since like 2013. So it's just been germinating for, or it had, it had been germinating for a while, um, but it was very heavily influenced by my love of like Wes Anderson films and just his very thoroughly and heavily, his thoroughly built worlds. Like Wes Anderson's films, the content of his films take place in their own universe very clearly even if that universe is right alongside our own, like it's very much its own world. Mm -hmm. um, and so we wanted to make sure that we did that with Zella. Um, I think that when it, it, we're doing so, just again, it furthers this idea of this insular society of the boarding school. So it was really just in service of that. Um, and then just in terms of like, me as a person, I love color. Um, and like a lot of color and we wanted to make sure that we stayed true to that as well. But also a lot of our talk and a lot of our discussions were around um, how would somebody who's very used or we knew that we were shooting a very beautiful campus with a lot of young, beautiful people and a lot of, you know, it was the middle of summer. So the world was very beautiful. Everything was so much beauty, beauty, beauty. And a question that we made sure we always asked ourselves was how would this very beautiful world look to a person like Sela who's very bored by the beauty and who at and who for whom at times the beauty is a threat. Um, and so that just changes the way you view beautiful things, I think, and it changes the way you photograph them. Um, and then also just, I'm a photographer and so Jomo and I collaborated a lot or a lot of our ideas and a lot of our research had to do with photography, um, which we both love. So it was, friendship collaboration thing i think that's why it worked really well did uh did you guys get to keep anything from the set that had the little spade drawn on it you guys have some with the spade i don't think so i was so I, 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 with everything that had a spade <laughs> on it i was like oh, i wish I wish. I kept the cards that they sent me the other day though so now i'm just like gonna, yeah yeah <laughs> I also kept my Paloma watch. Oh, is that the calculator watch? No, is that the one that she wore upside down? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which was 100% an accident. Upside down once, and then we didn't know when and she wasn't wearing it. So, so then Paloma's watch is always upside down, just so everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> um... Lovey and Celeste, I, I really enjoyed your relationship so much in the movie. It was so believable, these two coming together, like that feeling that you have when you meet someone, you're like, this is going to be my best friend that I've ever had. <laughs> and then you start to get closer and closer and closer. And then, you know, start, you see the real people that are there, That's not just your projection. And there starts to be some tension. And in Cella and, um, uh, so in this case, suspicions, so that it starts to feel like a retread of her other best friendship that didn't go so well. Um, how do you as actors sort of build that relationship that you had in such a short amount of time? Was there a lot of help from Tyresha and 
Yeah, there was a lot of um, help from Tyresha, <laughs> mostly. Um, it was very hard to. Tyresha had to honestly force us to spend time together. It was yeah, really yeah. There were times where we had to stop and not, and we'd had to like wait and talk to Tyresha privately away from just everyone else. So right because. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I loved her from the start. As soon as yeah, I yeah, found yeah. out she was a Sagittarius, it was like, <laughs> case closed. <laughs> Sag. Case closed. No, yeah, I mean, I I love this question, and I think it's really funny because, like, I feel like we get asked this a lot, but it literally is just, like, we just actually became really good friends as we were shooting. <laughs> <laughs> so like then it just translated really nicely on on screen <laughs> and also and also like in rehearsal Tyresha was like hey guys this this is rehearsal time and like you have to get to know each other like that did happen for sure yeah um, that helped a lot too that helped a yeah. lot too like like breaking down like everyone's lives and like asking them each other questions that was fun and yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that useful um so another uh aspect of this film that i love was the music um and uh uh T- terrence did the main song yeah the song you hear in the during the movie and then the end credits mm-hmm. infinite yeah. or infinity yeah I love which that. i'm obsessed with when i first heard that song i was like oh my god i have to find this i have to find it me too uh, and then I looked and saw that it was Terrence, whom I've met before. Um, Unfairly he, brilliant Terrence. Great at film. Great at music. Work. I didn't even know he did music. I was like, dude, just stop. Just stop with yourself. I know. <laughs> um, talk about uh, how did you, did you know Terrence was a musician? He's a producer on it too, right? Yeah, I met Terrence back in 2000. I put out the overture in 2014, so it must have been 2014, right? When I, oh, no, nope, that's a lie. I met Terrence in 2012. When I graduated from college, I had seen his work, uh, an oversimplification of his beauty in school, and I loved it, was obsessed, so he was brilliant, and he is. Um, so I emailed him because <laughs> I was like, the worst thing that could happen is that he doesn't read it or doesn't respond, and that's not a big deal. And I just sent him my senior thesis after I graduated. And I was like, love your work. This is the sort of stuff I'm doing and that I'm interested in. Um, would love to intern for you guys or something. And then I interned for his company, uh, MVMT, for like a month. Because you don't get paid to intern. So I quit. <laughs> and, but it was great because now, you know, I had this great friend and mentor. And as uh, I was starting to put together the overture, or after I put together the overture, he was so excited about that and was sharing it everywhere with Scott McCulley at Filmmaker Mag, who then profiled the overture. Um, and so Terrence has just been there from the beginning, and he's very consistent in helping, <laughs> and just like he's very genuine, uh, I guess is the best way to say it. And so when we needed a song for this moment between Sella and Paloma in the edit, and I knew how we needed to feel in that moment, but I just had no idea what song it could be. And also a song that we, with our tiny budget, could afford. Um, And so I was just like browsing through my iTunes and I came across that song by Terrence. And, um, you know, by that point he was already our EP. So it wasn't like a hard ask to ask if we could use the song and he let us use it for nothing. So that saved our butts because it's the perfect song for that moment. Had, had any of his songs been used in movies before, or was that his first? I, I mean, in his own work, yeah, a lot. And I think in other work, other short work, but I don't know if in a feature. I don't know. That's a good question. I wonder if he's on right now. Well, whatever. Let's <laughs> call Terrence. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see what he's doing. All right. Yeah. Let's see what, what uh, questions we got here from the audience. Uh, let's see, we already did casting. Um, it says for Tyresha, you and your project had so much success with labs and grants. What would be your advice to other filmmakers applying for similar labs? Hmm. Um, 
It sounds like BS when organizations are like, oh, but why are you telling this story? Or like, why are you the person to tell this story? But the thing that I really learned, at least from Sundance, even like every, in fact, every organization that I've been lucky enough to be a part of, it's not BS. <laughs> they very earnestly want you to tell a story that you would be the best person to tell. Um, and I think that that's just good practice and like good storytelling practice, at least for me it is. Um, so getting very specific and getting, and not being afraid of being too specific. I think, I think it was Barry Jenkins who said, mm, maybe he was paraphrasing because what I'm about to say it and it sounds like something a lot of people have said that the specific is universal, but he's the one I remember saying it. So we're going to say he said it, which is also <laughs> how a lot of women don't get credit for things, but it's, it's okay right now. Um, uh, the specific is universal. And I think that when I started to apply that idea to sell in the spades and just, I mean, I told a very, I, I'm telling an extremely specific story that I got a lot of pushback for because people thought that, or some people thought it wasn't a story that people would be interested in seeing, but I knew it was, and I firmly believe that it is. Um, and so I got more specific and that was some that was a choice that I made after we got rejected from things I just got more specific because I thought maybe that's the way to read that maybe that's the way to actually do what I'm trying to do is just get as specific as possible about these people that I'm talking about um and that's kind of what pushed it into being a story told at a boarding school about kids who don't live at home and who have an inflated sense of self because they you know been in these very privileged worlds um so yeah, be specific and don't be afraid of, don't be, of, don't be afraid of your specificity. Um, I think it's when we try to write for everyone that we lose everyone. Yeah. All right. Uh, I love Stella's relationship with her mother. What was the inspiration for that part of the story? Um, uh, I was once a teenage girl uh, and if, I butt heads with my mom all the time, all the time. And I love my mom. I get along with her great. She's my best friend. Um, but when I was a teenager, and this is something I didn't understand until I started writing Sela, the way that it felt to be told what to do by my mom was a lot more, it was, it felt so much more dramatic. Everything that was happening between me and my mom, way more dramatic than it could ever actually be. Um, and so in depicting Sela and her mother. It was really important to me to stay true to the emotional reality for Sela of those moments as opposed to the actual reality. Um, so that was a lot of it. But then also just, I'm really interested in moms. I, I just love moms. I think moms are, I don't know. I think moms, I'm still trying to understand moms. <laughs> when I put that scene in. And why all of my stories have mom stuff. <laughs> Love my mom. Um, so uh, another mom question for <laughs> Levy. What was your inspiration for playing Stella in terms of her relationship with her mother? Mm -hmm. I did like um, how there was such like a crazy, like sharp change, like with Stella in school and Stella at home. I feel like I, can appreciate duality. Like I can understand a girl that's like a boss, but like also like oppressed, you know? So for me, I was like, dang, like she's got layers. And then I was like, that's usually how it is too. Because um, a lot of the times like mothers have like mental like holds on like children a lot of the times. And um, I just love seeing that play and show throughout Sela while she was in school because it made so much sense. And that's like why I like telling stories. Like I love when it makes sense. So it, that's what attracted me to that. Uh, this person says, I also love the Paloma Sella relationship. Uh, for the actress who played Paloma, that's Celeste. Uh, <laughs> what was your inspiration for playing that role in that relationship? Um, I think that I, I kind of had to draw on like a lot of different relationships to kind of build this this relationship between Sela and Paloma because there were like definitely things I could relate to about about their relationship um, 
and other things I couldn't necessarily relate to. Um, so I kind of had to pull from all like a bunch of different friendships that I've had in my past to kind of like relate to and build their relationship. Um, and I also feel like this kind of the dynamic of like us in real life, I think kind of lended itself to, to the characters in some ways, not like the manipulative, like scary way, but like in the sense that like, in the sense that I was like new to like the film world and I hadn't really like been on a set like that for a long time and Love You was someone that was like more experienced and I was kind of like coming into this like new space, like really ready to learn and like, wanting to learn from the people around me. Um, and I think that was like also really true for Paloma, like entering this new school, entering this friendship with Sela and just wanting to learn and wanting someone to like look up to. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I think it was a combination of, of those, those things. Uh, I have a question, um, which is about your choice of going with Amazon to release uh, this movie because I, I had a Q&A with someone last week who had chosen Netflix and she had actually because she had made an LGBTQ themed movie and she felt like more people were going to see it on Netflix than would have gone to see it in the movie theater. What was the movie? Can I ask? Oh, it was um, uh, just came out on Netflix. Uh, oh my god, I just did a Q&A with her. Uh, it's Alice Wu's movie, uh, the oh. half of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of people saw that on Netflix. Yeah, that was. Smart. Um, I wonder if you feel that way about streaming too. That that a, a wider, more varied audience will see Sella than would have gone to see it in the movie. Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe. I I definitely think. Well, yes, actually, yeah, for sure. I think that if we'd done limited theatrical run and then VOD later, that sort of thing. Eventually, people who are talking about the movie and championing the film now on social media, eventually maybe they would have been able to see it, but uh, I mean, they would have had to wait. <laughs> and I grew up in Philly, loving indie film and loving the experience of going to the theater, but most stuff when I was younger skipped the Philadelphia market, so I just wouldn't see it until I could I mean, honestly, I probably wouldn't see it until I could get, like, an illegal link to it, because I was a kid, and I could, like, I couldn't, they didn't have any money. That's just what kids do. Um, but, so that definitely factored into making this choice. Um, I had to ask myself, why am I making movies? What's the point? What is the goal of this thing that I've created? And particularly for Stella and the Spades, the goal was for as many, I mean, as many black teenagers to be able to see it, to have access to it as possible. And so going with Amazon just meant, A, that a lot of people all around the world would have access almost immediately to the film. And then B, that, um, people, I just like, how do I say this? I, as a filmmaker, I just want to put the story out there. I don't care how you watch it. I really don't. I really don't. And Jovo and I talked about this a lot. And I think that it was something that we came to a realization about mostly when we started to watch the dailies for Sela. Cause we just look at stuff on our phones and we'd be hyping each other up. Like, Oh my God, this looks amazing. We're so excited. But it like looks really amazing on your phone. Yeah. So whatever. Like, I don't, yeah, I don't, I think probably because I grew up watching movies however way I could find them. I don't really care how people watch stuff. I just want people to get the opportunity to watch it. Yeah, um, it really some, It really seems like most fil f filmmakers feel most happy when their film gets to the to their audience. Yeah. And um, I mean, sometimes that's, that's really <laughs> hard. It's really hard to get it to the audience that you made it for. And uh, yeah. yeah, totally. Um. So this is going to be also a television series, uh, also on Amazon too? Mm -hmm. Yes. Where, uh, where yeah. are you at in that process? Very early on, developing, writing, uh, the beginning of it. So it's still very early on, but it's very exciting, very fun. <laughs> Will this be your first foray into television? Wait, no, you're doing two sentence horror stories too, aren't you? I, I was, I directed two episodes of Two Sentence Horror okay. Story and then an episode of The Twilight Zone. So oh I- Oh my God, that's exciting. Yeah, that's really exciting. I, um, 
Yeah. I know about Two Cents Horror Stories because my friend's a writer on that show. Oh, sick. Yeah. Yeah. That was a lot of fun, uh, especially because I got to stay in New York and it was warm. And it was a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, we are out of time, but thank you so much for coming and thank you for your thoughtful, wonderful answer. It was so fun to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, it was a pleasure. Good luck with the rest of your publicity tour, and I, I hope to have you all back someday to talk again. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Everybody watch Sell in the Spades. Yeah. Multiple times. Yeah. Yeah, like five or <laughs> six. Over just and keep over it on. And over. <laughs> I'm just replay. Have it on. Replay, repeat. <laughs> hey, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.